So we learned that greatest temperature really varies by land and water. How's that so? Here it is, our San Diego example. So the temperature is almost always the same in San Diego since it's consumed so much by water. It's almost all on the Pacific Ocean. So we go to Dallas, which is inland, and our other example we had was Fargo, North Dakota. We see quite a bit of temperature variation. It really tells the story. So mechanisms of global transfer. So we have a latitude imbalance, right? So if we have the tilt of the Earth's axis, and we have basically the Earth revolving around the sun, then at some point the latitude's going to be further away and sometimes it's going to be closer. That in conjunction with the Coriolis effect, which we talked about at the end of last chapter, where we have different winds and currents going one direction in the northern hemisphere and the other direction in the southern hemisphere, that that basically drives currents and fronts in terms of what we know is weather, short term and long term, we know it is climate. So the mechanisms to transfer energy are atmospheric and oceanic. So atmosphere, we have essentially what's called the westerly, so the westerly winds. If you fly in the United States, for example, and this is true in many parts of the world, if you fly from the west coast to the east coast, you will typically see that your flight time is shorter than if you fly from the same two locations from east to west. Why is that? Because of this jet stream and the westerlies we have. So winds coming in from the west, blowing going to the east. Essentially, when air, airplanes um, take off, they tend to ascend or elevate very quickly and they get up in the jet stream to help them out. That's called a tailwind and then against them is a headwind. So we have tailwinds on westerlies going west to east and then east to west we have headwinds blowing against us. Simple analogies to, to pull this all together. Okay, and then we have places where these kind of meet each other, and we see that subtropical gyres, large elliptical loops, where they run into each other and kind of back off and kind of run into each other in circle. So we have northern hemisphere uh, variations, southern hemisphere variations. So in the northern hemisphere, we have a lot more land masses um, in general, and in the southern hemisphere, we have land masses that are close together, much larger oceans that also impacts where it is. So if you notice, we have really large areas of ocean. We tend to have um, these gyres formed, these circular areas kind of converge on each other. Why is that? Because land heats up and cools down faster than water. So it drives that. Okay, so temperature patterns. We see high latitudes gyres form. We see s several in the south that we just looked at on the previous map. We see the Gulf Stream, and then we talked about the trade winds. Uh, Western intensification, really good example in terms of tropical gyres that occur off the east coast. Uh, Coriolis effect, greater higher latitudes since we see more change. It's basically the twisting or turning that we talked about both with air and with water gets um, the further it gets a, goes into um, the extreme area from north for the northern hemisphere and south for the southern hemisphere, the more that that gets intensified. Upwelling, so cool current getting pulled away from the western coast, so we're starting to see these like temperature anomalies explained. Uh, that essentially show us why we see long-term types of things occur. So upwelling up the coast, pulling away from the western coast, deep water rises. This can also be um, referred to on a micro scale as turnover. So sometimes uh, water heat up and cool down um, certain types of that the uh, year. It's kind of like what we have for temperature inversions. 
Then we have the environmental lapse rate, which in our terms, um, in our temperature scale, is three and a half degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet. So as we go up, what we talked about at the beginning of chapter four is that through the temperature changes, um, through air pressure or air going higher, there's less pressure or less weight of the other air. So we see as we ascend or go up in elevation, we see the temperature decrease at a rate of three and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Here we have the rate of six and a half degrees Celsius. Okay, and temperature inversion is kind of like the lake turnover we talked about in our previous two slides, or basically the upwelling effect on the west coast, where we essentially have air that's normally low go high and vice versa. So we can have a cold front go over a warm front and actually trap the warm air down and keep, that's typically when we see um, particulate matter or, or um, CFCs um, some, somehow detained in the environment. So we see this in Denver pretty often, unfortunately. A uh, really good picture on the top right here that shows the inversion and the layer that it's trapped. It's kind of interesting that the smog um, and the CFCs and the ozone and all that, there's really a line that it's kind of caught under. So you can actually see that on that graphic. The average temperatures we can see using ISO lines, lines of the same number kind of interpolated or drawn through, kind of like what we do with um, contours here, we call them isotherms. Then we can also detail seasonal patterns, what's the temperature likely to be in January, February versus July and August. And we can also use isotherms for average annual temperature. So here we're kind of gone we're really balancing between weather and climate because we're looking at it over a year. It's not necessarily weather because it's not tomorrow, but it's not climate because it's not many, many years long-term trend. Uh, global temperatures, um, we do refer to an urban heat island as far as long wave radiation that we get into um, that comes in our environment actually conducing the heat. We usually see this in very um, built up cities that have a lot of concrete steel. So we see temperatures around the cities heat up more and more. And then kind of getting into our climate setting of things, global warming, scientific evidence the earth is warming. Um, historically, the earth has been cooling and warming um, as we've seen in several of the, the cores, especially out of Antarctica. And it, there's a lot of scientific research that. A lot of this is being made caused in fairly recent. So we say that's from human enhanced greenhouse effect. And then there's a lot of political organizations that are being addressed, including the Kyoto Protocol and then the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change to address that.